What's going on everyone, Austin John Plays here, and today we have a whole bunch of brand new official information for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. There was an event that several members of the press, YouTubers, and gamers were invited to. I was not one of the fortunate few who got to play Pokemon Scarlet and Violet early. So, I decided that I was going to review all of the videos, including half-hour interviews, hour-long discussions, and literally every piece of media that's been out since 9am today for all of this information. And there's a lot of fun little nuggets that we're going to be going over. I'm going to be, I'm going to be quoting exact people on their claims about the various things about these games, so if any of it is uh, untrue, uh, don't look at me, all right? And if you think that this video is gonna be full of a bunch of information you already know, there's 18 badges in the game. I have your attention now? Cool. While many of these people did say the same things, I am going to be focusing on specific details that are going to be uh, some stuff that you don't know, some stuff that I didn't know, and some stuff that I'm excited to learn. First, we're going to be starting with Casey from IGN. Casey is essentially the go-to person that IGN has to do all these things. She did a significant amount of coverage for Pokemon's Sword and Shield DLC, if I recall correctly. She's a fantastic journalist, and they put out a five-minute video, and here are some details from that. Firstly, let's talk about the most important thing, sandwiches. Between all of the videos that I've seen, there's mixed feelings about the sandwiches. Some people see it as being uh, more of a nuisance, some people view it as a fun mini game. I'm sure that, you know, us as gamers, we're gonna have the same polarity of opinion on that. But when it came to the sandwiches, Casey felt as though she didn't want to do it a lot if it wasn't for the really good buffs. The buffs that we've seen are similar to the O powers from X and Y, however, there's more being discovered from the the small amount of footage that we have, and we can only wait to see exactly what's going to be happening going forward. Casey has also confirmed that experience share is going to be on for the entire party all of the time. And when you're doing auto battles, auto battles are going to be giving much less experience points than regular traditional battles or versus trainer battles. And auto battles are essentially used for grinding materials from various Pokemon all throughout the world. When exploring out in the world, there are going to be many NPC trainers who will not initiate battle with you. Instead, you have to initiate battle with them. This makes a lot of sense considering, you know, it's an open world game. You could literally just go around or over that trainer and their field of view. So the fact that you get to choose if you initiate the battle with them, that seems honestly just to make a lot of sense. There's going to be very easy to spot. They're going to have a very large exclamation mark over their head as well as I've seen small chat bubbles that are like, hey, let's battle. Auto battling throughout the entire map is only going to be one Pokemon at a time. However, when going into the Team Star compounds to do, you know, their whole quest thing, you are going to be throwing out three Pokemon of your choice. You can only enter the compound with three Pokemon for this, you know, sort of mini game. For this demonstration, all of the reviewers were actually given an overpowered team for this area, which they were able to go through the minigame no problem. However, when they battled the boss of Team Star's fire crew, Mila, her ace Pokemon, which they did not state what it is, most likely a Pokemon that has not been officially revealed, is extremely powerful and for most people said wiped out more than half of their team with ease. Alex from Nintendo Life put out a 25 minute video and discussed many specific things about the game in more of a personal monologue with B-roll cuts. Alex went on to discuss a lot about the performance of the game, which not many people did. Some people mentioned it here and there. Some people stated that their performance of the game wasn't great, but it was a fun game. If you don't follow me on Twitter, what's wrong with you? But also, if you don't follow me on Twitter, I put out this tweet, including a side-by-side -side of a Japanese trailer and the US trailer, specifically about the performance of the game and how the Sun Flora move. You can see that in the English version on the left, they move extremely choppy and on the Japanese version on the right extremely smooth now this game is developed in Japan by people who are Japanese so it makes sense that the most recent and up-to-date build is going to be the Japanese version and there are certain 
points of progress that then get sent out to the American team for the American translations. And then they probably update from there. I don't know the specifics. I don't make video games. But it seems like all of the reviewers were playing this out of date American version that uh, has this horrible performance of Sun Flora. This is also seen in the large windmill when entering that town. He also lets us know a fun bit of information that the open world is an open world. However, all of the towns and cities are their own specific map where performance was significantly, uh, where performance of these smaller maps seemed to be much better. There is a loading screen between the open world field area and the specific towns. In addition to that, the gym battle was its own separate map, which ran flawlessly. He also states that the problem that was present with Zacian and Zamazenta in Pokemon Sword and Shield, when it moves around, when it turns around, how the model just turns around instead of, you know, actually walking like a dog in a circle or a wolf, uh, that issue does remain present in these games. Why? I don't know. They obviously can, you know, pathfind it to make a circle. Alex then goes on to talk about the user interface and the quality of life changes that we saw implemented in Pokemon Legends Arceus regarding things like the experience bar. When gaining multiple levels, instead of it going whoop, 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 it just does the one thing and then the additional bit and it tells you all the levels that it gained or all the experience that it gained, it just goes up those levels. I don't know exactly who stated it, but we do know that you can relearn moves from the interface. You no longer have to go to a specific person to learn those moves. As far as trainer customization, there are four uniforms, one for each of the four seasons. However, there's a plethora of different accessories and many hairstyles to choose from. You can customize your character, change hairstyle, eyes, things like that, as well as the accessories for the characters anytime you want. It's literally a D-pad mapping. However, to change the color of the hair, you have to go to the salons, like here. He also stated that the salons are suspiciously similar to the layouts in Sword and Shield. Also, some great news is that there is no hairstyles or clothing accessories that are locked to appearance, gender. So at the beginning of the game, while no one has seen the beginning of the game, we could assume that they're continuing the trope of choose your appearance and there's going to be eight different models to choose from of different skin tones and different leaning toward a specific gender. However, when it comes to hairstyling, you could have, you know, uh, longer, more feminine, flowy looking hair on a male appearing character. While they're not using these terms, I'm just using these to describe these a little bit more. The GameSpot video done by Lucy James and Steve Watts was a 10 minute video that actually covered some things that no one else has. There was one thing that I wanted to talk about, which is, oh, stealth attack. So there are several ways to initiate battle with a Pokemon. They run into you, you run into them, or you catch them off guard. If you were to do, think of Pokemon Legends Arceus's uh, backstrike, something similar to that to initiate a battle, you would then go into the battle and the first turn of the opposing Pokemon, they are unable to move. They're caught off guard or flinched or something like that. So it does seem as though while you can't catch Pokemon in the overworld like you could in Pokemon Legends Arceus, you are going to be able to still have that sort of advantage when going into a battle with one of these wild Pokemon. Lucy then goes on to explain that she wanted to pursue the path of legends. That's when you have to go around and follow uh, Klauf, Klauf. So she went in to follow Klauf, who once you enter the canyon, you get a call of, hey, there's a giant Klauf here. And then she went, battle Klauf, Klauf ran off. And then she followed and hunted it down again. She battled it again. It ran off to outside of the area which they were allowed to partake during this demo. And she was told by the staff there to not pursue it anymore. It does seem as though these Pokemon, these Titans, are going to be reoccurring things and they're gonna go in various areas. So it's not just a quick one and done. For Game Explained, Tris put out a video saying 20 plus new details, which was a quick rapid fire video. One of the things that they talked about here, which then they echoed in their We Play Pokemon Scarlet and Violet for over an hour, 33 minute video. I've watched both of these. We've seen players' idle animations react to certain weather conditions in Pokemon Sword and Shield. Like if it's raining, you see the 
That has always been a thing. However, now your following Pokemon will react. Triss claims that while they were playing their <sighs> Giraffe Rigs evolution, their Ferrigarath, who was their following Pokemon, when it started raining, started running in circles, almost like it was happy that it was raining, like you would see a dog, you know, running in mud or whatever. They also stated that the NPCs also seemed to react to this. When it started raining, you would see the various NPCs who were walking around in the area cover their head and go to cover. This is actually a pretty neat thing that I didn't expect them to do. Because in a lot of games, that's not a thing. If it's raining, it's just raining and they just stand there and deal with it. However, in the discussion video, Triss also explains that while doing the Team Star Fire hideout, their Fergarigarath had trouble pathfinding during the Let's Go feature and started running in circles again. So at this point, I do not know if your following Pokemon is actually properly reacting to the weather or if that's just one of the animations that that Pokemon does. They also spent a good amount of time talking about the sandwich minigame, which Triss personally enjoyed. Building a sandwich, it's mandatory that it does not fall apart. In addition, once, a, once an ingredient is dropped onto the sandwich, it cannot be picked up again. Think of it like a reverse crane game. You're just going to go and you're going to drop the ingredients. We do not know the penalty for having the ingredients not stay on the sandwich itself. Maybe it's just whatever the overall objective of that recipe was. It's not as powerful. We don't know. They do spend a good amount of time talking about how the trailers that we've seen previously, as I suspected and alluded to, uh, were very selective trailers that had a lot of things removed from the environment so they could focus on whatever one thing they wanted to show you, like the one Terra Jigglypuff that they had in that one trailer. That is not how the actual game executes. Instead, there is a plethora of wild Pokemon everywhere. Good Vibes Games went on to talk about several details in their seven minute video that I did not hear anywhere else. Specifically, they talk about how the Let's Go Battle feature will not be able to tell the difference between a regular Pokemon and a shiny Pokemon, according to the Nintendo representative who was there with them. However, a Let's Go Battle Pokemon will not engage in a battle with a special Terra Pokemon. Those are the ones that we've seen glowing in the trailers like the Jigglypuff I mentioned before. Milo, the boss of Team Star's fire crew, after she's defeated, is going to hand you a badge. One of 18 badges in the game. There are eight badges that are going to be given out by the gym leaders and 10 additional badges between the two other quest lines, the Path of Legends and the Team Star battle quest line that I forgot the name right now. There's no specific word what collecting all 18 badges does, or if the 10 badges from the two other quest lines are at all related to the sort of championship league or the regular Pokemon gyms, we don't know. That's just brand new information, seems very vague. They're the only person who talked about it. A portion of this review session also included doing a Terra Raid Den. There are predetermined text prompts that you can share with your teammates in Terra Dens to coordinate with each other which I think is fantastic because there's no voice chat or anything and sometimes you're just gonna be in a random battle and someone may say a specific thing that can, you know, lead the flow of that entire battle. Also, a representative of Nintendo stated that the AI for the game, whenever you're playing with uh, NPCs, is significantly better than it was in Pokemon Sword and Shield, which is quite a relief because Cosmic Power Lunatone was not helping anyone. Maheen and Sam had a discussion video on the channel Games Radar that discussed some specifics about this game in sort of an interview style questionnaire that was about 15 minutes in length. Of this, there was one specific piece of information that I found extremely helpful, that while doing a Terra Raid battle, you have to use three attacks before you can actually terrestrialize. However, during regular battles, gym matches, stuff like that, you can do it turn one. In the Terra Raid Dens, you have to wait until three attacks are done. They did not specify if it was three attacks by you, meaning like you do an attack, everyone does their attack, you do an attack, everyone does their attack, do an attack, everyone does their attack, and then you can Terra. No specifics about that. Or if it's three people of the four have done an attack, and then you can Terra. 
we don't know. It seems like it would have to be after three rounds of turns that you're then able to terrestrialize. Also, no one specifically spoke on this, and I don't think I've heard this information anywhere, but you do have four Pokemon taking on the Terra Raid. All four of them are going to have the same Terra type. So I'm assuming, and you know what happens when you assume, that after the three rounds of battle, you can then coordinate amongst yourselves to determine who is going to terrestrialize. So all four of the Pokemon are going to be getting that specific typing, which sounds very versatile. If you're going into a Terra Raid Den, you don't know what Terra type you're going to be facing down. It's handy to have a variety of them. Games Radar also went on to give us an additional detail about sandwich making that we have not heard anywhere else. It turns out that the food that you eat is going to impact the wild Pokemon encounters, meaning that the types of Pokemon that you're going to be encountering as well as the size of Pokemon. In my previous video, I was looking at this screen that had all of the different types of meals on here that you can cook, and one of them said Teensy Power. That actually means that the Pokemon in the overworld that you're going to be battling are going to be smaller versions of their default size. Similar to how we saw in Pokemon Legends Arceus, how Pokemon have a range of sizes that they can be before being, you know, the full alpha Pokemon. It seems like that implementation is going to be carried over in this game and you're gonna have some influence on it as well. This is a really good thing in case you have to find yourself a big weasel, that's for sure. Washington Post Gaming put out a five minute, 48 second, unnarrated video showing off the specific gameplay clips they, they got from the Pokemon company. There was no new information in this video, I just wanted to shout them out because it's the only clips I have of this with the full audio, and a lot of people cut out the audio, I don't know why. And I say Philly Beats used video for last, since in my last video I recommended that you go watch it because he did a fantastic job. There are some specific things that I wanted to talk about. The Path of Titans lets you encounter the Titans, and you can do them in any order. He's the only person to state this information. In fact, I, I, I feel like Phil asked a lot of really premium questions to the Nintendo rep. He also stated that there is an in-game time that goes between a full day-night cycle. However, unlike Pokemon Sword and Shield, it's not locked to your Switch's clock. Instead, it's going to be a naturally occurring in-game timer, similar to how we've seen in Pokemon Legends Arceus, as well as Breath of the Wild. He was not able to find anything that could skip time or let you impact a specific time of day to play, but once again, they only played a very small portion of the game. Phil also stated that while he was playing, he saw Pokemon families present, meaning that if you saw a Growlithe, there's a chance that there's an Arcanine nearby. In addition, Pokemon pairings as well. For right here, we could see uh, Zangoose and Saviper, who are known to be rivals, hanging out with one another, or battle or engaging with one another. That was unclear. I assume things like this would also be present for Miltank and Tauros. We haven't seen Tauros in the game. The bull Pokemon taking place in Spain. There's probably something going on about that, no official word, but there's a good chance we would probably see Tauros hanging out with Miltank, even though they're from different generations. They've always been considered a pairing, even back in Sun and Moon where they shared uh, a Pokedex entry page. As far as auto battles, the two most important things that are taken into account are your Pokemon level versus the opposing Pokemon level and type matchup. It seems as though having attacking moves is not mandatory for auto battle leveling. So in theory, if you, I don't know, started the game with only a Magikarp or one of the other Pokemon that doesn't have any attacking moves, you could actually level it up by doing auto battles and not having to, you know, do splash 35 times, then struggle. Bill was also the only person to mention the drops that happen from auto battling. And as we've seen before, there are specific drops related to a Pokemon family, like we know Lechonk drops the Lechonk hair, not ham. However, he also found an Everstone, which now makes me wonder, why did he find an Everstone? He did not state the Pokemon that it dropped from, probably for very obvious reasons, because we can't talk about Pokemon that aren't officially revealed, but I have a theory that this auto battle mechanic may have a chance for you to obtain a wild held item. 
You may be familiar with the concept of wild held items if you played Pokemon Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl and you tried to get yourself a Magmarizer or an Electrolyzer from Elekid and Magby in the Grand Underground. Or if you ever try to find leftovers, you're always hunting down a Munchlax who may hold it. These Pokemon always have a chance of holding these items, and I'm thinking that maybe there's an auto battle chance that when knocking out this Pokemon, you may get their held item if they are holding it. We have to see specifically how this works, if it goes off of the original numbers that we've always seen, or if they've been changed around, or if you're guaranteed to get it if the Pokemon is knocked out. Kind of interested to see that. Much easier way for you to farm items instead of having to have a Pokemon with Frisk or Trick or something like that. Phil also stated that the Jigglypuff that we saw in previous video clips is not just standing in one place not moving, as we've already learned that this is specific build of a game that had a specific layout for that trailer, but in the build that they played, this Jigglypuff was walking around, as well as the other Terra enhanced Pokemon who are walking around. They are supposedly a wide range of levels and maybe a significantly higher level than the other Pokemon in the area and pose a challenge for you. No one was able to state these Pokemon if after you defeat them, which isn't easy, if you can catch them, or if there's some sort of mechanic that would allow you to not catch a level 50 Pokemon at the beginning of the game if you are able to take it down. Think of the very strong looking Pokemon in the beginning of Pokemon Sword and Shield. If you picked Grookey, there was a chance that you were able to take down that Onix, which I did do, and I still was unable to catch it. Or if there's an unstated system in place, for example in Pokemon Legends Arceus, if you were to be in the first area and completely over level yourself like I did, I was on level I was level 65 before I took on the Frenzy Noble Cleaver, and I still was unable to catch the Alakazam and Blissey in that area because there was a system in place that wasn't explained that you're unable to catch these alpha Pokemon when you're too low of a status. Phil also got information from a Nintendo representative that when a Pokemon terrestrializes, they are going to be keeping their original same type attack bonus. This is brand new information and honestly seems a little out of place. For example, Cerule Edge over here is a fire and ghost type, but if he terrestrializes into a fire type, you would then think that he loses his stab of a ghost attack, but according to that Nintendo representative, that is not true. So Pikachu, who terrestrializes to a flying type, is still going to be retaining the same type attack bonus for its electric based moves. However, it's no longer electric type and it's not affected doubly by ground moves coming to it anymore. This seems really out of place and a little weird. I don't know if that's accurate information from that Nintendo employee, but if it is, pretty useful. And the one last little bit of information from Philly Beats U's video is that the red vending machines inside of the Team Star compound are there in place for you to help heal your Pokemon during the horde battle that you're going to be encountering. There we go, that is all of the premium information that I was able to find from every single source who covered this. And I'm of course gonna, you know, link it all down below. Uh, if you found any of this information helpful or you wanna support these channels, I definitely recommend going and checking out their original video. It's all going to be linked in the second line of this description and uh, thank you so much for being here. If you learned anything new in this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up button. If literally you knew every single thing in this video before launch, uh, then hit the thumbs down video and let me know that I messed up somehow. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time, Austin John out. Man, they see me shining like I got the charm. Stay strapped, got that jet ball in my palm. Fell from the sky, guess I'm the chosen one. And if you need to know how, check out Austin John. Champion flow, flow, yeah. I got that champion flow, flow.